everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, uh, it's our honor to have Matt LaCroix, uh, host and creator of Matt LaCroix's Ancient History uh, YouTube channel. It just focuses on all sorts of things, and uh, I don't want to you know, do a long-winded introduction on my end. I'd rather you be able to say to our audience exactly uh, more about what you do and who you are, if you don't mind, Matt. Sure. Thanks, guys, for having me on. Um, I really look forward to this discussion. I am a young, passionate researcher and writer, I guess you could call me, uh, where, like many that delve into this and get curious about a lot of this alternative history and trying to question and understand better the nature of reality and the world around us, um, I, from a very young age, really was just a very inquisitive and, and very unique person. I think um, a lot of, I actually think that I, um, the way that my enthusiasm and intense energy would really, um, a lot of people would either really like me or they really wouldn't like me at all. Um, it was an interesting road. And I, I, because of that though, I was, I spent a lot of time really alone, uh, hiking and really exploring the wilderness and pushing myself in that way. And it wasn't until later on that a lot of the questions that I would constantly have when I was out doing things, I realized it could be found in a lot of ancient texts and a lot of the the books and the knowledge that really we were we weren't taught in school and the things that we weren't really um, privy to. And so that was what put me on the road of was saying, hmm. So there's a lot more to all of this that can be found with the inquisitive person who wants to go learn um, and put together all of this. And as we'll get into, it has it's not just about ancient wisdom left behind from ancient cultures, but it's about an entire paradigm of us being uh, far greater than we're told and having a story that's far older than we're, we're told in school. And so that journey of well saying, well, what is the real story? And you know, who are we? And how far back do we go? And how sophisticated were we back then? And you know, how does that translate into now? Those kinds of questions really have driven me um, and and taken me on a, a, a journey and a path that I never expected um, 10, 15 years ago to the point where now um, it's really just uh, quite a deep passion of mine to try to understand these truths of our past and how it relates to now. And I have to say, from our side, we I love history, and I know uh, our host here, the other host, of it, we, we all love history because it really does build up to who and what we are today. And oftentimes when we see the world around us, it's a compilation or it's a buildup of things of prior events, right, that lead to where we're at now. Uh, I think it's fully folly to un- try to understand the world around us without thinking about the history. Uh, a lot of Buddhists had said that the world around you is composed of three things, right? Your um, your past, your present, and your imagination. Well, one of the, the things that you talk about, and I think that is very interesting, and I myself found uh, watching a, 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 almost all your videos, to be honest with you, it, there was a couple of discussions you had about the ancient city of Iridu. Uh, I think... What was the most interesting discovery that you've made? I don't want to put any words in your mouth or anything like that. So far, because there's so many mysteries out there, which one has been the one that you've been focused on the most lately? Well, I think the the story of Eridu is a very sad story. Um, And for those who don't know the significance of Eridu or have never heard of it, I can give a little bit of a background into all of this. So when we... When we look into the narrative that we're told in school, that human civilizations are only 6,000 years old, and they um, slowly develop to the point where we're the most sophisticated in terms of our knowledge that we've ever gotten to, when you really look into a compilation of all the ancient texts, and then you look into these ancient structures and these cities and these ancient tablets, you find out where really that's not the case at all. In fact, we're quite a shadow of our former self in terms of our understanding of the universe and energy and what the, what the planet is and the, how it relates to the cosmos and what we are and 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 consciousness and how we can use our uh, the ability of our imagination and creativity to to do so many incredible things and what what comes out of that is when you start looking at all of this in a different light and you say, okay, well, so the things that we're t- told in school about human civilization being 6,000 years old, we know that's not true. We know that civilizations have come and gone in a time frame that is three, four, five times longer than potentially that. We're talking about something that goes back 
well over 12,000 years ago, over 20,000 years ago, potentially over 50,000 years ago. This story that seems to have so many layers like an onion where civilizations have emerged and developed and become in their own way sophisticated and then they were destroyed in great catastrophes and then they had to rebuild again and re reintegrate that knowledge and the problem is that every time that that's happened more and more of that original knowledge has been lost so it's not really this linear perspective like we've been told where it we're at the point where we've developed now to the most sophisticated in terms of our understanding we're actually um, trying to catch up to much of what they knew. And so how does that how does that relate to Eridu? Well, in those ancient tablets in Mesopotamia, the cuneiform tablets from the earliest civilizations that ever existed, the ancient ancient Sumerians, not the not the later Sumerians that were taught in school. We're talking about a, a culture of um, civilization in the Fertile Crescent that goes back well over 12,000 years ago and different versions of them have come and gone. And the original Sumerians wrote these incredible texts in, um, that have been amassed in great libraries you know, on these cuneiform clay tablets that tell this story that is completely different than we're told. And what they all state, um, whether it's Eridu Genesis or the Sumerian King List or Uruk List of Kings and Sages or um, uh, the myth of Adopt. So many of these tablets state that, look, there was a city that was the first city ever created here. Not like it just randomly, a bunch of nomadic hunter gatherers decided to group up in the Fertile Crescent of Iraq along the Tigris, Tigris and Euphrates rivers and create something. No, it was created there for humanity to sort of rise up in civilization. And Eridu was that very first city ever created. So in many ways, to me, that should be like this world landmark of of our start, and it should be one of the mo it should be, and it is one of the most important ancient um, ruins and locations anywhere in the world. And the tragedy behind that is because of this the the control system that does exist with history and the narrative of history and protect and through religion and how that has connotations with some of these ancient creator gods that are told in the tablets to have created this, this city has been, is the greatest tragedy of any ancient site in the entire world. And it's been left completely abandoned in the deserts of Iraq. And it's just being looted by black market individuals and there's no protection on that site and it this the actual ziggurat temple itself which is where all the the most significant parts of the city have has never even been excavated by archaeologists and before someone says well that's just a um it's just a, a means of slipping through the cracks no this is my opinion it's the greatest tragedy of any archaeological site in the world that has been deliberately left abandoned because of how it could completely rewrite our entire narrative. And I and, and as I've talked about in some of my previous shows that you've probably seen on Eridu, you can see photographs of it from the last year or two that show this temple has seashells all covering the top of this of this ancient eroded temple mountain, which means that that could have only happened from some great catastrophe that led to the oceans rising up and covering over it, which is exactly what the tablet state. They say that it's a pre-Diluvian, pre-flood, pre-disaster city that was then destroyed and, and, and essentially is left abandoned there. And so today, what I'm trying to do is help bring awareness to a site like Eridu. And that's why I created that campaign to protect Eridu. And I've done numerous shows on it from Gaia to my own YouTube channel um, and others where we, I basically want to point out, look, there's no one else doing anything to protect this site. And we have to, as a, a collective society of people, band together to make enough noise to change this um, entire system here where certain sites that fit the narrative are, are uncovered and, 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 and worked on. And then these places like Eridu that are like almost like forbidden archaeology are left deliberately to the wolves so that all of their artifacts can be stolen and sold. And then no one can find the truth about how... how it was um, an ancient ancient city that is truly would reset our understanding of how far back civilizations here go.
So why is it <clears throat> why is it that you think that nobody wants to like take a team up there and try to like uh, you know uh, dig up this site? Like, is it because like you said it, it doesn't fit the narrative? It's going to change the narrative? Um, or do you, you think people like are scared to see what they might find out and like like it's going to be like a culture shock where everything's gonna be like oh you know there actually was like ancient civilizations that lived here before us? Like, why is it that you think that nobody really is trying to go after this um, these uh, these buried sites? Well, that's a that's a good question, and it gets into how certain sites like you look at for instance they'll uncover like ancient roman sites and they can say oh look the romans were around during this time period and so we can fit this in neatly into this narrative that we're told in school again how civilizations arose six thousand years ago in that region in the fertile crescent but that they're and that they uh, progressed to you know things like egypt and the indus valley civilizations but what we find is that it, the narrative is actually a lot more complicated than that, much older. And Eridu is a problem because Eridu pre presents a situation where the evidence that's found there completely destroys the, the narrative. And people who don't know this narrative, it's the, the education doctrine of, in school that has been developed by the Rockefellers. You have to teach that civilization is 6,000 years old. And Eridu is a problem because Eridu presents a situation where it proves that the, our story and these civilizations are far older than that. And, but it gets, it's deeper than that. We're talking about a situation where because of religion also and how it's um, demonized certain concepts and certain symbols, like the famous symbol of the serpent that we find through biblical references that goes far, far, far back into this city itself where Enki, that one of these creator gods, these um, Mesopotamian gods that was the one is his patron city of creating this. This was a, a demonized figure within religion. And, and so you're seeing two avenues that are basically working together to make sure that this site doesn't ever see the light of day. And it's the, the powerful, um, you know, Christian, the early... Um, Holy Roman Empire, later Christian Empire religions that uh, that emerged and still are still are powerful today through the Vatican and Rome, but also through these educational doctrines that have been established by things like the Rockefeller Institute, where this site is off limits for so many reasons. And I can give um, a little bit of background for those on this site itself. It was um, it was on in 1849, Austin Henry Laird found an ancient library in known as the Ashurbanipal Library in Nineveh, Iraq. And it contained this massive amount of cuneiform tablets. And in those were many of those tablets that I mentioned before, where they talked about specifically in there, well, look, Eridu is the first city ever created. And it's, it, it existed before the, the flood, the great deluge of the younger Dryas catastrophes 12,800 years ago. And it's, it says that in every tablet. So what happened? Well, in the late 1800s, before this control system of the narrative existed, they did excavate the main city of Eridu, and they found all these incredible tablets, and those are on display today in um, at the University of Oxford. We can still see that, but what happened? In They excavated up until 1946, 1948, that one part of that city, and they found all these relics and artifacts, and then poof, something happened. Someone's organization, these these powerful entities that exist that control this, they basically shut this entire program down. And since 1946, 1948 time period, that site has never been touched by archaeologists ever again. But more importantly, that the main part of the site that's separate from the city, the, the great temple of the ziggurat that I mentioned, which is where most of the secrets would be, um, that was left completely untouched and unexcavated. Like it was deliberately not looked at i think they they knew what would come out of that and so since then how do we know what's come out of there and all these images um there are pictures on google of people have uploaded just like citizens of um baghdad iraq and other places who have just figured out that this city's there 
that it's ancient and it has all these relics and it's been abandoned and they're just flaunting that they're walking into the site and there's no fences. There's no, um, there's no infrastructure at the site at all. It's literally completely abandoned and they're going in and finding these tablets sticking. And we have, that's why, because we have pictures showing that they're, they're like bragging and showing them in their hands and everything. These tablets just sticking out of the ground that they're just picking up without even having to excavate the site. They're just, oh, that's how crazy this is. They're picking them up and they're flaunting that they have them and they're just selling them on the black market. And that is the situation right now with the most, in my opinion, the most important ancient site in the entire world. I wonder, I, I keep thinking about uh, what governments would gain from, or maybe I guess they have everything to gain, or, or maybe not just government, just entities, societies that just don't want information that contradicts the narrative. Uh, contradict what we know about history. It would rewrite the way that we understand ourselves and our entire, you know, evolution, creation, our starting process. I think back to the libraries, like you mentioned in uh, Asher Banipal, the one that we also see in Alexandria, all these times in history where collections of free thinkers and, and people that are really, truly going after truth and knowledge all collected in one place. And unfortunately, some or some other events, whether it be accidental or on purpose or just a sign of the times occur and then that knowledge is gone. I see the same type of thing happening nowadays where we have, you know, arguably most, if not the greatest amounts of human information that we think available now, but it's on sitting on servers, whether it be on Google, whether it be on Bing, just com computer servers that house this information. If something were to ever happen, then that's lost to us. But I think now we, 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 we try to conserve both knowledge and life the animal lives, you know, species of fish or, or cats or whatever it is, endangered animals, but our entire history is on the line, and yet no one pays attention to the fact that, you know, this is, like you said, they're being they're being sacked, and nobody's doing anything about it. To me, it seems so strange. If it was anything else, if it was the history of national arts or whatever, being, you know, sacked the way that that is, it would be an uproar. It would be a stop to it immediately. But for some reason, this isn't. Do you have any running theories on what, what other reasons there could be for for this like blind eye that's being turned to this to these events right now? I guess it, that's a hard thing to answer because a lot of people don't like to realize that things aren't really the way that we're told and that there are um, there are powerful individuals that orchestrate a lot of things around the world and also um, manipulate and protect certain narratives and doctrines. And it's not simply a system where um, you go like you go to school as an archaeologist and you get a degree and then you are free to make your own opinions and determinations based on the evidence of a site. That's not the world that we exist in today. We exist in a world where in um, around 330 AD, um, Constantine created and uh, transformed the Roman Empire into what's known as the Holy Roman Empire. And that is actually where this entire story begins about controlling the narrative and destroying the past. It began there and in Constantinople with Constantine um, creating what was known as the Holy Roman Empire. And what they realized was that they could rewrite the entire narrative to fit their own version of history. And the way that they were able to do that is by going out and conquering and destroying all of the previous ancient knowledge that existed before before the monotheistic Christianity was adopted by them. And so the Library of Alexandria, the great Egyptian library of knowledge, was burned down by the Romans. And then they went and destroyed Egypt. And then they went through and destroyed the Gnostic writings. And we found them marching around throughout Europe and the Middle East and um, basically conquering and, and burning and destroying everything they could along the way. And so what happened was that some of these ancient pre, um, they call the old religion, the pre um, group, the groups that had the ancient knowledge from those earlier civilizations, they had to hide their, their knowledge in caves and bury it. And they knew that it was being, um, it was being sought after for destruction. So like when we look at something like the Nag Hammadi scriptures, the most important of all the Gnostic writings that was found in a cave 
that was hidden in, um, within along the Nile River that was in some ancient Egyptian knowledge, they had to hide it. They had to hide it. And that's why when we look all around the world at these forbidden texts, ancient, even ancient Hebrew texts like the Book of Enoch yeah. and a lot of these other ones that – and the Egyptian Book of the Dead from Egypt, they you find that all of these – um, original teachings that are described in later Christianity and these stories about great floods that are in the Bible, they all are predated by these writings, but they rewrote them all in a different way. They rewrote them in a way that it shows certain individuals throughout history as being heroes and who were actually the conquerors and were the bad guys. And a lot of the influences of both religious texts and just historical narratives are so biased and so uh, inverted that when we look at all of this, we have to almost tear down those antiquated viewpoints and start over again and say, well, okay, well, let's look at the evidence and have that determine where things go. So why, how did this happen with Eridu? Well, um, Eridu is the most significant of these ancient pre-Diluvian Sumerian cities. And it's the one that was the, the sole principal um, city that was a patron city of this ancient Mesopotamian god Enki. And that god Enki became the most demonized of any individual and in, in figure throughout history. And so this city has been abandoned and, and left in the way that it is for many reasons. It really is a, a very complicated situation where um, just like the story of the the biblical story of like garden, the Garden of um, the Garden of Eden with the serpent that is demonized as as teaching um, these early Adamites basically the knowledge of good and evil. That serpent figure in that is Enki. And that's why when we see how the serpent and the dragon became demonized and we see the cultures around the world, the Americas, that were originally founded, not in their later states, but originally founded, like the Maya with Kukukan, this dragon serpent god, and the Aztec with Quetzalcoatl, this dragon serpent god, and down into South America with Viracocha, dragon serpent god, the exact same thing was this symbolic connection back to this ancient struggle that goes back f much farther than anyone really knows or realizes um, that basically tells a story of different groups here that have been competing to create civilizations in their image and then other ones that come through and corrupt them and destroy them. And that's that hidden struggle that I call the eagle and the serpent that has gone all around the world. But that's why Eridu is so forbidden because not only would it completely rewrite our entire narrative, but along with that, people would go in and read the ancient texts associated with it where Adapa was, that was the first city that the supposedly the perfect mankind was created and lived in. And they were considered far superior to what we are now. And the, the whole point of why that's important is that you would go into everything from ancient Sumerian texts and ancient Hindu texts, and you'd get into ancient Mayan texts like the Popol Vuh and others. And you'll read about how we are far greater and more important than we've been led to believe now through modern means and through school where like defining things like consciousness and defining our ability to what our purpose is in this in the universe and, and here is completely different than we're told and what would what it would do what would be very much disrupt this entire system that's been created here the system of people believing that they are really nothing significant and important and that money is all that matters and that they they'll go to work and work most of their life and have this like little narrative of what they're really th supposed to do and then they die and the, the problem is that there's a paradigm that would be completely changed with a place like Eridu because you would find ancient texts that would describe us in a way that is not only far older but so much more sophisticated so I think it's a very complicated set of reasons why that site and, and others have been left um, abandoned. Like I want to give you one more example is that there's a site in, in southern Turkey that is connected to this called Gobekli Tepe in the Anatolia region. And that site um, has been radiocarbon dated in an accurate way because it was buried originally um, to be 11,800 years old or 11,600 years old. And that's essentially double the narrative that we're taught 
about civilization being here. And that in the same, in a similar way to Eridu, that site has only been 5% excavated today. Only 5%. I mean, Eridu is abandoned, which is terrible and tragic. But even a site like Obeki Tepe that gets all the attention that it gets within our circles has is still only 5% excavated. Like the amount of effort that's going into a place like that is is so minimal because it doesn't fit into the narrative. And so those places are largely left either abandoned or just partially excavated so that their great secrets will remain hidden and people and you know things that are found will end up like in the Vatican archives and people or, or the the basements of the Smithsonian and we, well, we never really learn the truth of what comes out of them and so hopefully we can bring in bring enough awareness and change the understood and excavated for you know for us to understand the truth and I think that's what we're slowly getting towards and people like you and I and discussions like this help push that forward but there's we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think uh, as more audiences get a chance to even have their interest peaked, but really like dive into this, I think the uproar of uh, desire to uncover more truth can't be ignored if everyone is working together. I think in history, that's a lot of the examples that, you know, again, the Tower of Babel of, of a society of people working together that would had to be spread according to, you know, biblical stories. But in every situation where people begin to work together, there's always something or someone that ends up trying to stop that. You know, again, we go to modern examples of history. It could be related, it could not, but the idea is uh, nobody wants something or or some group of people don't want the up, you know, the combination of people's language or the combination of people's uh, opinions to be formed. So it, it seems to happen all through history. And again, the struggle, be as you mentioned, the eagle and the serpent, we know that the East always revered the serpent as a wise, a healing creature, a creature of knowledge. But it seems like the West always seen, saw it as a monster, a destructive force, a demonized entity. But it's always interesting to see how the, both cultures approach things differently, right? It seemed like the West had a far more aggressive way of looking at things, while the East um, had a very holistic, very nature-centric uh, looking, uh, or at least uh, belief or structure, religious belief on things and it seems like it all started back in the ancient cities of that we see now you know that are just like go black technically has a lot of secrets that yeah. we still haven't uncovered I, I think it's always interesting um or not even interesting it's it's imperative that we begin to dig deep into our own history but i i don't know uh where where would be the best place to start and i think Eridu Arid- because it's the first and most ancient city I think that seems to be one of the best places, and it's also one of the ones that it's being, you know, like you said, it's being sacked, and it's also being, uh, I, I, I feel angry, and I try not to let emotions get in the way, because there's nothing I can do from where I'm at now besides spreading the word, but seeing people that don't value the history that's there, having it in their hands, taking pictures with it, you know, destroying ancient history that could hold secrets to what it is that we are, and what it is, why we're here, and why we exist in the first place, it seems so, uh, I, I don't know what the word is besides, you know, a massive disrespect slap in the face to to our own species. It seems like such a stupid way to act. And again, I wonder how much information, you know, some organizations have. I know the Vatican has vast numbers of uh, libraries under their city and they'll never share that with anyone. But I wonder what it is that they know that they keep sitting on. To, to your thought, what knowledge do you think, which library housing knowledge was the biggest loss to humanity thus far to your understanding which one was it really what we're what we're talking about here is why you know why don't why don't people care more you know why is it is are things the way they are if you like i remember back um in high school and even into some parts some aspects of college not before I was on this road at all and before I understood that there's so much more that we don't know. I remember being in school and being interested in history, but it, the way that it was taught, it was like you like yawn and want to like fall, basically fall asleep because the version of history that we're told is so boring and so mundane that people ask, you know, why is it important that we know this, that someone conquered some place back then and then that city fell and then something happened later on you know why is that why is that important well like you and like you said it gets back into something so much greater than the majority of people here even realize it's a situation where our history 
and the forbidden history, we could call it, the history that goes much further back that's connected all around the world with great civilizations like Atlantis, like Plato describes in great detail because Solon traveled um, to Egypt and met with great temple priests at the Temple of Sais, and they told him this great, this ancient story of a, a sophisticated civilization that once existed and gave all these details about it and described how it was destroyed in a great catastrophe. Now, when you start looking at that and you you map all of these civilizations around the world that are much older, you start to see a narrative unfold, something that comes together that is um, presents a completely new perspective about how we have risen and fallen over and over again and that the current state we're in now, despite all of our incredible technology, we still lack an understanding of, well, how could they, how do they even build the Great Pyramid of Giza? How are they even able to design a structure that is mimics half the ratio of the earth that is basically in tuned with the um, the energy of the planet and how it's built in a very specific location to be like a mimicking the, the heavens above with the three belt stars of Orion and even connecting to the Sirius star system and how it was um, it's like a a miniature version of basically like earth within the cosmos within the it's the most sophisticated ancient structure in the world and yet we're told in our history books that it was built by khufu as a tomb mm -hmm. and really that has that has there's no evidence that any pharaoh has ever been found in the great pyramids and we know that they were all bur buried at the valley of the kings and so we we see that over and over again this false narrative to protect the significance of what these structures were and who built them originally and how far back they go you can see that it's all connected. It's all connected to this understanding that despite the technology that we have today, our understanding of the cosmos and energy and reality and the, our purpose has been largely almost lost to where we are now because of the destruction of our past and how so many things are found along the way. And I'll give you an example. In the famous Asher Bonham Paul Library that I told you Austin Henry Laird discovered in 1849, that library had over 30,000 cuneiform tablets found. 30,000 that basically some were talking about laws and rules created in their society, but others were in these other cat. Like you know, if you went into a library today, you would have different sections where it's one section would be about like ancient history, then another section would be like about commerce. And then another section would be like about trade. That's exactly what this library was. So it contained this mass of, of a totality of their entire civilization's knowledge, okay? And that gets in also to what you brought up too about how if something happened to us with a catastrophe, what would be left with our digital technology today? Because these cuneiform tablets were created in such a brilliant way where they etched in their language and their story into these tablets and, and then they fired them with heat and they were able to survive for thousands and thousands and thousands of years whereas we know that paper even in that primitive form of paper lasts 500 to a thousand years in perfect um environmental conditions so let alone imagine like a, a computer through a catastrophe like how that would that would just did we would just that would disappear we would never have any digital data all paper records would be gone and the last all we would have left over are a few structures and a whole bunch of plastic and that's how we would look at this but re really what we're looking at when we when we see that these other civilizations the point i was i was making before these other civilizations like the sumerians with the ashurbanipal Paul library when they excavated that in 1849 and they started translating those tablets, of those 30,000 tablets today, which we can read Sumerian, Akkadian now, and we know how to do that, of those tablets, only a couple hundred have ever been translated. And nobody knows where all the rest of them are. That's the wild thing is there's a display at the University of Oxford called the Ashurbanipal library display but it contains like i said less than a hundred tablets so why isn't anyone asking the question where all the rest of them went you know and what's on them yeah. is that is that the whole purpose behind this is that the ones that were translated were the ones that were a little bit too ambiguous and were difficult to um understand and decipher in which they they are 
but is that why we were only given those and then the rest remained somewhere? You know, if I was to guess, I would say that they're, they're most likely in the, uh, in the Vatican archives. Um, if I was to just, you know, to educate, just to guess on an, like an educational level that they're probably housed there. And so to me, someday in the future, I really hope that all of this happens in my lifetime, but someday in the future, when this whole entire paradigm crashes down, you know, this pot of consciousness bubbling up that finally reaches to a state where people are asking these questions that are necessary and you get this massive um, push by society, which I don't even know how we, we can get there with how powerful it is. But eventually when that falls, imagine how much is kept there and how much we don't know about. And I want to give you another example. When the the Spanish through the the great, you know, the great eagle war empires of like the Spanish Empire and the Romans, when they conquered the Americas, when they went into a place like the Mayan Empire, they burned and stole like literally everything. And they re they rewrote their whole story for them. And there's these stories of like the Aztec with the this, the, the flag of Mexico with the, the eagle eating the serpent. That's not an original Aztec flag. That was a Spanish flag yeah. showing you the conquering of those civilizations. But the point is, the Popol Vuh is really one of the only ancient texts that survived in the Mayan world. And that was only because a certain priest decided to protect that knowledge from the, the original people. But the rest of it is gone. We don't we don't know where it is, but I mean, most likely because of the connections with those empires, it, they basically came in, found all these texts that tell a completely different story, much older, much different than we than, than the Roman Empire wanted to exist. Right, the empire never died. It they took those and they just take anything that doesn't fit, and they just put it in some secret vaulted library somewhere where people don't get access to it, and that's how we know because you take something like the book of Enoch that was originally supposed to be a Christian text and it was taken out because it talks about ancient Nephilim giants and all of these um, angels and demons that are basically fighting over our reality and our world and so many other things. Those didn't fit the narrative. It didn't fit this, this determined narrative. And so over and over and over again, it's these forbidden texts all around the world, and Eridu is just simply a forbidden site that has so many forbidden texts. They're just kept away from the public, and so we get this little snapshot of how we should be made to believe that history is and how we should be told what we are and that we're in the significance of what we are and all of this is determined by them. And someday, and in, it's in starting to erode, especially doing shows like this with others, this is starting to become like almost like a joke to a lot of us around the world because there's so many obvious telltale signs of that all of this whole narrative and historical context is so different that um, when you start when you you look at it you almost like want to laugh because it's 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 insane how silly it is and we can get into talking about megalithic civilizations around the world and how that provides such an obvious marker as as well for this. So when people listening to this, this isn't like the opinion of a non accredited archaeologist that is um, that hasn't studied this and doesn't have the credentials to be able to understand this. I'm just one person of many who is telling this is saying the same thing. We're all saying essentially the same thing, and that we're pointing out so many of the obvious signs and the evidence that shows, well, look, this paradigm is almost like laughable at this point and is going to collapse. The question is, how fast do we want it to? And what is, is society willing to reprogram their understanding and their mind on this with new evidence to not be afraid to look into the past to understand what we really are and, and how far back we go? Yeah, yeah, I... I think there's there's so much information out there, uh, and just like you're saying, there's so many things that contradict the history we know. Again, repeating a little bit of it, but it's true. Uh, the Book of Enoch was a big one that really made me think and pause a lot when I was uh, when I was first even discovering that it existed because it wasn't hidden away to the point that you can't find out about it, but it was hidden away enough so that you have to dig in order to know about it. 
And, and, and that was one of those, along with the Sumerian solar system map, to know that they were such an ancient civilization, and we always thought of them as primitive and not have copper tools, and maybe if they did, didn't use it very well. But how then would they know? How, how would they know about the universe? How would they know about our, our exact solar system and the distances, the sizes? And then, again, every one of the other ancient civilizations, their, their start or the beliefs, their, their, their cultures always dictate that there was some being that helped them come to realization of consciousness or knowledge. That, that seems to be something that transcends no matter the culture, the language, or even the part of the world that, this, that the people were in. It always seems like we had assistance in order to get to where at least the starting blocks were. And that's something that does not seem to be expressed when you look at conventional history of our, you know, of our starting points. It's very, that, that seems off to me. Is, is that something that you found as well as you were looking into ancient history? We, we had these conversations on, you know, with friends in the podcast, with some of the people that, uh, that we know, um, external, you know, just people that, that when they discover that this simple truth of the solar system map, that just blows people's minds when they've never even thought that that was possible. And then you go into the idea of the pyramids, how how precise they were, or they still are uh, when they were built, how even you can see generations later, other cultures, when they take over the region, they try to do renovation works, which really, you know, end up failing in comparison, even though they came later than the ancient ones to the original works, you know, like the Sphinx, the, the the pyramids. Every time they try to renovate it, they realize, you know, this tech, whatever it was that made it was far more advanced than what we have access to, the tools that they used and the knowledge they had in order to make it. And we can understand that even now there's Japanese swords that were forged in such a way that we can't even replicate, even with all our, you know, our fancy ways of doing things, they still can't do it. So there's knowledge that's for sure not trans- that wor- that wasn't transferred and that was lost and some that maybe remains a mystery that someone maybe has and just won't ever, you know, release for some of the reasons already stated. I just wonder if more people knew about these ancient mysteries, if that would trigger then, if that would be the, if that would be the match that lights the forest, you know what I'm saying? If, if that's the, the point. To me, when I heard people like you and others speak about the fact, again, that the pyramids are not only far more ancient than we originally believed, but their purpose are still really unknown because they wanted to neatly package it in a, in a, in a, in a gift and say, this is exactly what it was. It was tombs. And if that starts to fall apart, well, actually then it was just there to store grain. That's why now there's tunnels. It, they try to find some reason to cover for each new discovery, but it doesn't fit un- unless you take into consideration the idea of ancient civilizations that were much wiser, smarter, and were able to maybe even to have knowledge of, you know, space travel or, or knowledge of beings from outside of our realm or outside of our world, that's something that seems to be debated and not tr- not explored. W- w- what are your thoughts on uh, on those things? Because I, man, I, I, yeah. I definitely want to hear that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess the place to start is people, people underestimate or underappreciate the significance of something like the Great Pyramid of Giza, the largest and most sophisticated structure on Earth. We're talking about a structure that was created with two and a half million megalithic granite granite blocks, granite and sand, uh, granite and limestone blocks that are have an average weight of ten tons each. When we try to wrap our heads around that, we look at modern cranes today and their ability to build structures. We're not only talking about and looking at how impossible it would be to do that with just those blocks and the size of that to create that, but to create it in such a perfect way where it's aligned with these different um, shafts that, like you said, they're, they, they have all these ridiculous theories for what they call, what the reasoning behind them, like air shafts and other things that are pointing towards the Orion constellation and Sirius constellation. And the pyramid itself is mimicking half the ratio of the entire earth and is built exactly in the, in the middle of the land mass of the entire planet and happens to connect to these ancient energy centers and all these things. When we look at the sophistication behind, and that's only just like scratching the surface. When you look at the sophistication behind the Great Pyramid of Giza, you have to wonder how it was even built. That's the thing that I think gets uh, doesn't get really talked enough about is when you look at 
take great pyramids like the Great Pyramid of Giza, take the ancient um, Hindu, the ancient temples like Kalesh Temple in India, a, a gigantic mountain carved into it, incredibly sophisticated uh, basalt temples out of a single mountain, cut, supposedly all done at one time. And then you go all the way across to the Americas to the megalithic um, gigantic perfectly created blocks we see in places like Peru and Bolivia and the ancient texts speak about the fact that there were these great creator beings that were creating civilizations around the world and there were the Apkalu, the seven Apkalu, okay? And those Apkalu have been shown in depictions all around the world as traveling around, creating civilizations in their image, creating great libraries and then leaving and then departing. And then later on, the, the civilization either becomes corrupted or it, it gets destroyed and another civilization comes along and tries to mimic what they were doing. You see that with the ancient Peruvian sites. You see that especially with the Aztec and Maya. And you see that with Egypt. The same thing. I mean, if, if I like to say this all the time, but it's really important that people understand. If I go walk down the street to a monument somewhere and I spray paint my name on it, does it mean that I created that monument? No, not like not at all. It's the, this most ridiculous thing in the world. And so the entire reason why something like the Great Pyramid of Giza is credited to Khufu was that they found that someone had written his name in there in one place inside the pyramid. And there's no writings anywhere else. And this is one place where they wrote that. And then, boom, poof, it's, it was created for Khufu. And so that's the, that's the silliness behind how we look at all of these civilizations around the world and then those creative um, influences that led to their, their rise, um, we falsely identify them with a, even both the, of the wrong time period and we falsely identify them with being uh, from, the wrong, from the wrong creators, the wrong influences. And so um, when we look at it, though, from the standpoint of these original um, influencers of these civilizations, like give me an example, like the Sumerians. Most people don't know that the Sumerians are credited with essentially everything that the the the, the moral framework and the the structure of our society today came from there. They they're the ones who were the first to come up with mathematics. They're the ones who were the first to come up with astronomy, astrology. They're the ones who came up with agriculture. They're the ones who came up with metallurgy, um, animal husbandry. And the list goes on and on and on. That's only at the beginning. It, literally everything came from there. Now, what's amazing about that, besides the fact that it came from there, is number one, that they state that they're not the ones who, who came up with that knowledge. And two... When we look at who they were that they say they came up with them, these they called these great gods the great Anuna or Anunnaki, which is just the term that is an umbrella term that means those who are from heaven or above, whether or not it's another density or dimension or whatever it is or just coming from above here, they essentially taught them everything. And they're the ones who went around the world and created all these civilizations. And that's why Eridu being the patron city of one of these creator gods, Enki, was later demonized. But what's amazing is that there's a cylinder seal from ancient Sumer that is called VA-243. And in that cylinder seal, it shows Enki passing on the plow. Right? People will be like, who cares? Big deal. He's passing on the plow to the civilizations of the Fertile Crescent there, which is what Eridu was originally part of. Why, why is that so important? The agriculture, having the ability to have complex agriculture is the basis of a civilization. If you can't have a civilization that has an agricultural system, it will never be developed. You'll simply be nomadic hunter and gatherers. And that's why in a place like Gobekli Tepe, nearby to the north, when they excavated that site and they went through the layers, they found essentially that they saw hunter-gatherer, nomadic hunter-gatherers in this layer, and then all of a sudden, poof, just above it, in like this extremely short time period, agriculture and all this sophistication just came out of nowhere. And then they, they go on to create the greatest cosmic 
cosmic library ever created. And that's what the Gobekli Tepe is. It's a, it's a cosmic library of the, all the constellations around us, mapping the precession of the equinox. And so the point is, we have direct evidence in many, many places that show that this knowledge was transferred to these civilizations, which is why when they left and departed and those civilizations were destroyed, the later subsequent cultures that came were not able to understand anywhere near the degree of what they did because every single time that that happened and there's these, these catastrophes look like they're cyclical, the knowledge was more and more lost because there wasn't new knowledge being ingested into, into those civilizations. It was like scraps and remnants of the past. And in many ways, we are trying to catch up and figure out all of those things now from all those subsequent cultures. But in many ways, we are um, very primitive in our mindsets compared to what they knew. And so that's what's so exciting about the past is that when you can dig into the ancient stuff, you can get into an, uh, a whole scenario where you can gain more knowledge than we can today just simply looking at our world. I think as you're saying, one of the most interesting things is when, like you're saying, all the things that we've learned, and that's only from looking like at a peak behind the curtain of what's actually there. Like you said, there's a lot of sites that are only five, ten percent. You know, even the the most advanced are probably like I would say thirty percent explored. Not to mention all the different with lidar uh, advancements, we're able to see that there's temples, there's proof of civilization in, in the middle of the Central Americas. We we haven't begun to discover enough about our past but what we know already indicates like you said there's some sort of creator beings that helped get us a jump start in our in in, in our you know entire being our entire species so there's there's so much to be uncovered there's so so many mysteries that i guess are both answered yet also you know peaked uh, interest uh, it causes our interest to be peaked because there's, there's things that uh, again like we we've been saying it doesn't line up with known history and the known history, most likely, is probably not real. It's fabricated all, all across. Even the date that we live in, right, the, the year 2022, as we know, that's not that hard to discover that it isn't real. It's not the correct date, but it's just the date that was chosen. So one, one only has to look at the, the amount of hieroglyphics that are available for us to see, the, the research that has been done for us to know, you know, it's, it's being fabricated, and the reason why it's being fabricated is, completely unknown but there has to be you know a, a good amount of information out there when we when we start diving into it from to you what is the most interesting or maybe the most revealing or the biggest revelation that you discovered as you were you know looking through i mean even the handbag like all, all the the serpent and and the, the eagle there's so many things but out of all the things you've discovered up to this point what has been the one that maybe shocked you or impressed you the most well, wow, that's a that's definitely not an easy thing to answer. There, there's so many things that all tie together to come together that just blow my mind. I guess, um, I guess where I where I started was, and I I think it, it'd be good to clarify this is that I remember being in school and learning about these Sumerian tablets in a very like, um, in a very simplistic way where oh these are just ancient poems from the region and they're just um, analogies for certain things and um they're not there's not really not really much there right and i just remember being completely blown away by and like and i'm i'm like many others where you start on this path and you will maybe pick up something like zechariah sitchin and you'll start reading that you'll be like wait is any of this true and then you start going down the road and i became i guess the the whole story of the anunnaki and their influence here and the tablets is personally for me the most incredible of and and that's that's a hard statement to answer because some of the megalithic stuff and the pyramids and all the other ancient texts they're all they're all incredible and amazing in their way but for me the stories left behind by the ancient sumerians were um, the greatest of my sparks of what to look for because when i started to go in and look at it i i figured out that wait a minute so this has nothing to do with zechariah sitchin at all and, and I later come to realize that, yeah, a lot of his translations weren't accurate, but that didn't mean anything for the significance of these creator gods role in history and what the real story was at all. In fact, it only in, in, emboldened me to 
to know what the truth is. And then I started to go down the rabbit hole of like, like now I'm re to learning how to actually read cuneiform. But oh. more importantly, when I did the research, I figured out, well, look, we have ancient Sumerian cuneiform became a dead language and it was when it was those tablets were first discovered in 1849 nobody knew how to translate them it that language had been dead a dead language for over a thousand years for well over a thousand years and when i learned about the actual history of great heroes and men like george smith who in my opinion is the father of all ancient sumerian in in our in our modern history he was able to take a dead language that has no alphabet which is just characters and words and he was able to uh, decipher it because he was brilliant and he spent more time studying the ancient sumerian culture than anyone else the ancient sumerians and akkadians and babylonians he became bar none the greatest um the greatest expert on that who still has ever lived and his translations are available for anyone to find but people don't even know about him he's not even he's not even a footnote in most of history and later his for his translations to then be verified by other amazing experts in their field like Samuel Kramer and then later Stephanie Daly in the 1980s what we find is that there's a common story here that's shared by the greatest translators of these languages in, in history that are all saying the same thing. They're all saying right, right in the open. And, and, but, but that that's what's also interesting is they'll present the text to you and what it says, but then in their descriptions and talking about it, and George Smith is the only one that really – uh, maybe, maybe in some ways, Kramer, but George Smith was before the control systems were really here, was able to talk about it in a more open way, and he had some profound things to say about these tablets, the myths of them, and the idea of looking when I actually read them, because I started to look through them and point out specific cities that are mentioned, things like the legend of Atana, mentioning how it's the first city created after the deluge, the first city created after the catastrophe of the Younger Dryas. And then you go read things like the Sumerian king list, the Uruk list of kings and sages, and you and, and others, and you're like, wait a minute. So they specifically list cities that existed before that were destroyed by a great catastrophe, which is supposed to be a myth, yet it's shared by cultures all around the world. And then there's tablets that talk about cities that were created after. Like, how is this simply just um, not like a historical documentation? And that's where I started to become almost obsessed with the tablets because they presented a way to have a timeline. And that's essentially what later led me to create my own timeline. And for anyone who's, who's interested on my website, thestageoftime.com, I created an entirely new timeline that destroys the timeline that we're told in school that goes back to 200,000 years. And it, it, I try to place where all of these events and these ancient writings are based on the clues that they presented within them. Like, for instance, Plato tells us that Atlantis was destroyed 9,000 years before him. Okay? So we take that as a historical context with most people not knowing that they learned that story from ancient temple priests of the Temple of Sais that was later destroyed and that they gave him those dates. And so if you take 9,000 years before him and you, you correlate it with, with when he lived, you get, the, you get 11,800 years, the same date of both Gobekli Tepe and the time period of when you look at ice core samples of the Younger Dryas catastrophes. It's all the same thing. And that's how when I say, okay, then you take something like the Atrahasis and you look at how it describes Shurupak as being the last city that ever existed here before the deluge and then Kish being the first one created after. And you start to, have, you start to formulate an ancient timeline that is completely different than we're told. And I think that those moments when you can have those aha, like those things are well documented, they've been well translated, and they present this narrative, that to me, it blows my mind. And the struggle between the Anunnaki, which is what that whole biblical struggle of, 
um, angels and demons and, and the gods battling in heaven. That's that comes from them. It comes from the idea that there were these powerful creative creator gods. And I want to emphasize that. I don't I really don't think it's it's any kind of this ancient alien type of aspect. I think we need to move away from that. They seem to be sophisticated and superior in aspects of creating and magic and manipulating reality in a way that we we can't even understand. And they, they talk about it in, in the text. There's numerous texts that talk about them coming here at these different time periods and altering things in certain ways and then creating civilizations and then creating us in their image. So the whole story unfolds in a way where when you get the, the accurate translations, and again, I uh, the, the the books that I've written, like their stage of time, I have numerous um, cuneiform tablets from the greatest translators. You can go read in there. On my website, I have it, and I'm also writing a new book with Billy Carson called The Epic of Humanity, where we're trying to include the most important of all of these ancient texts from the best translators to protect all of these ancient texts because right now if you were to be curious and go look at all this how do you know where to start it, you're scattered all over the internet and you're trying to figure out where all these things are and i think one of the goals of mine is to put all of these most important texts but also the most important parts of those texts because you can get lost in the in the length of some of them all in one place so that people can go read them and see for themselves and see how incredible this our story is and see the influences and how far back it goes and when you do that when you step outside and you and you look up into the sky and you and you look up into the heavens and uh, the stars shining above you with countless star systems all around you you realize you're part of something much greater and you're part of something that goes back to a much older time where someday you know, we will realize that we've been manipulated and controlled by certain groups and empires to protect that narrative from ever being known yeah. so that we will never be able to empower ourselves to who we really are. That's a perfect way to, to pique the interest of those listening to find out more because it's definitely true. So many times we, we think about being the rats in the maze and we never think about why are we in the maze? What's the purpose of this place? We just kind of continue onward. So I'm glad that, you know, there's people like you out there that are truly, you know, dedicating a, a, a huge amount of their life to uncovering the truth that, you know, as as it continues to become clearer and clearer, I think will change the way that people not only look at their own lives and existences, but also work together to better the life that we're actually living because I think once that information gets out, I think yeah. th there, there's no way you can you can go back to sitting in a, in a cubicle or living a, a normal life because you now you're aware of it and now you're if at least it it, it prompts you to have conversations with exactly. people and then with those conversations, everyone else's light bulbs start to turn on and they start seeking this information and I think it'd be undoubtedly unstoppable to to prevent people from wanting to learn more and you know maybe moving the forces that be to be able to continue to research this and dedicate the funds and time that it really, it really respectfully deserves in order to, for us to find out more, not only just about the creator gods, but just about us, what our purpose was as we were created. Why do we have this fascination with creation, improving things? And that's something that we can get obsessed over, whether it be athletic performance, political things, we just have an obsession over improving and creating. And I think this is, this is a wonderful opportunity for people to see more about some of the work you've done and the people you've collaborated with as well as being able to support you both financially and also be able to to give you guys the voice that you guys need by amplifying it through through their audiences, to their people, to their friends. I think this is important. And, and I, I thank you for being a part of the show today with us, Matt. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the kind words. And I really appreciate meeting other individuals like you that have that quest to want to know more and to not have that old false paradigm be controlling your entire viewpoints and you're willing to be open-minded enough to look in a different light and i mean isn't it isn't it fascinating though that when you have yourself that instead of being something that um dwindle the importance of who you are or make it something where you you gain a perspective that is not empowering it's the complete opposite 
this empowers us to understand and look at consciousness in a completely different way, who we are, the importance of all of us, how significant we are in this place, and, and how significant we are in the cosmos. And so I really appreciate every single person that is willing to change their mindset because I want to point this out to you. So like, why does it matter, right? Why, does, why if you change your mindset and you talk to a few people, like what does that do? It changes and starts to tear down this, this old collective consciousness that exists here. We as a 8 billion hum, human beings here have a shared collective consciousness on the earth. And as if anyone has ever looked at like the 100 monkey effect, it doesn't take 80% of everyone to change their mindset to have this paradigm crash and, and crumble. It takes a certain small percentage of the entire group of these collective creative conscious people like you guys and others to come together and change our mindsets and then project that out and it will shatter this it's it will come down and then eventually we will transform our our thinking and ourselves into something completely different than we are that great metamorphosis that it's always talked about whether or not you want to look at it through the lens of the caterpillar and butterfly or the serpent into the the great feathered dragon those are simply the metamorphosis that have been told and handed down to us from countless ancient cultures and texts throughout history to have us look at things in a different way and to truly remember who we are. So I really appreciate being able to talk to you guys today. Thank you. Thank you. And if it is, we'll put um, this in the description, we'll have links to your website, to your YouTube channel and other materials for those that uh, are also listening live right now or not live, but the ones that are listening now, is there any, anything else that you'd like to point out or any other uh, places you recommend or any other channels you recommend as well? Yeah, there's so many great individuals doing work here. Um, you know, I give shout outs to my work. I'm very proud of the work that I'm doing on countless new shows, adding a lot of new evidence and things to like Gaia. Um, another, I, I'd like to give a shout out to like Billy Carson and his Forbidden Knowledge TV and also um, Fifth Kind TV with Paul Wallace and Tony. Um, and all of the the great masters who have come before that have led to this, like Brian Forrester and Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson and Robert Schock and John Anthony West and um, and I'm and I'm missing several uh, several others. And there's so many important people, Gerald Clark and a lot of these other individuals that have come that have paved the road to hand the torch down so that we can could carry on this work. And because our work isn't done, and we're simply continuing to help crumble this narrative and i just really appreciate everyone who supports this work and is open-minded to us changing the future and rewriting our story so thank you 